I've known Mr. Rogers for years. Meet a 101-year-old hero and see how this Mr. Rogers is blessing his neighborhood. I'm just trying to live for my heavenly father. Plus, a mother of four. It was like this kind of electrical sensation that went through my body. In crippling pain for two years. I quit doing the normal things that I enjoyed doing. Her supernatural healing on today's 700 Club. I knew that what she had spoken was directly for me. Welcome to the 700 Club. And for today's top headlines, let's go over to the CBN News Desk. Terry, people in national capitals around the world welcome the new year last night. Here in the U.S., some two million revelers brave frigid temperatures for the celebration in New York Times Square. George Thomas brings us some of the sights and sounds. From the far corners of the world, people welcomed 2018 with a bang. This was the scene above the Acropolis in Greece. For the East, in towns and cities once held by ISIS terrorists, crowds also gathered to welcome the new year. In places like Ukraine and Russia, where simmering tensions still continue following the crisis in Crimea, revelers were hoping for a more peaceful year ahead. To be honest, it would be really great if these problems with Ukraine came to an end finally. From Paris to Frankfurt, <laughs> thousands braved frigid temperatures for that special moment. Increíble. Muy bonito. It's incredible, beautiful, perfect. It's a little cold, but definitely worth it. In Paris, which has been hit by a series of attacks in recent years, the celebrations took place under tight security. And speaking of cold temperatures, throngs of New Yorkers and tourists from around the world ushered in 2018 in what was officially the second coldest New Year celebrations on record. I didn't expect it to be this cold. I knew it was going to be cold, but not this cold. It was only 10 degrees in the Big Apple at midnight, but that clearly didn't stop these partiers. By the way, in case you are wondering, the coldest ball drop celebration was in 1917, when temperatures in New York City barely inched above one degree. George Thomas, CBN News. At least 12 people have been killed in the ongoing protests across Iran. That is according to Iranian state television. The report says armed protesters attacked local police stations and military bases, but it did not say where the attacks took place. The protests began Thursday in Iran over economic issues. The demonstrations have spread to several cities and hundreds have been arrested. North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un said today the United States should be aware his nuclear forces are now a reality, but he said they are not a threat. He made the announcement during his annual New Year's Day address on North Korean state television. He said the North has completed its arsenal and a nuclear button is on his desk. Kim added the entire U.S. mainland is within strike range and the U.S. can never start a war against North Korea. Some local YMCA's or young men's Christian associations often lack any sign they're Christian. But as Paul Strand reports now from Orlando, Florida, there's a movement to make the C for Christian in the YMCA shine again. Pretty much everyone knows about the YMCA. The letters, though, have become like IRS or ESPN. People say them without knowing or thinking about what they stand for. YMCA stands for Young Men's Christian Association. But some Ys forget that C in YMCA. That's what Craig Seibert and others at the U.S. Mission Network want to change. He says George Williams, the man who started the YMCA in the 1800s, would have expected the C to be front and center because his Christianity also came first. Williams put that into practice where he worked simply by joining with a fellow believer to pray for each of their co-workers by name. 140 or 150 employees of Hitchcock and Rogers where someone said you could not find a Christian there after a three-year period 
the, uh, that same person said, you'd be hard pressed not to find a believer in Hitchcock and Rogers. And so it really started as a workplace prayer movement. Larry Whittlesey explains how those prayer warriors then began ministering to the young farm boys pouring into London at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. They got together and said, we have to find something a little more wholesome for these guys to do. So they started a prayer meeting. So the YMC actually started with 11 other guys, George Williams and 11 other guys, as a prayer meeting in an upper room of all things. In recent decades, this strong Christian foundation began to fade at some of the whys it helped create. It's only in the last generation or so that it's kind of shifted away to that toward physical fitness and some of the other great things that the Y does. But what we're seeing right now, though, is a resurgence of these seeds that have been watered now are beginning to sprout. And we're seeing new sprouts of Christian ministry work and the lifting up of the sea in a new century. One such sprout comes from transformational leadership and its founder, Ford Taylor. After failing at business, Taylor turned to the Bible. Where I thought I was God's gift to business, reality is I was not at all. God has lots of principles for business, ministries, families, governments, schools, education system. And what happens is when you apply those principles, they work whether you believe Jesus is the Son of God or not. Now Taylor's organization and others are working with Christians at WISE to bring those biblical principles alive again. U.S. Mission Network founder Bob Hall. I think that this is the secret sauce. Coming back to our uh, foundation, which is Jesus Christ, can, nothing, can do nothing but strengthen the YMCA movement. One huge part of that massive rebuilding effort comes by WISE, offering people much more help beyond their physical bodies. And they encounter a marriage encounter, a financial peace university, or divorce career, or grief share. They can, can sense that the God is still part of their lives. God can be introduced to them in a very safe way. You find the possibility of real transformation because it is a safe place. It attracts people into that environment that would never find the either courage or the connection to come in what, uh, into what they would perceive a more isolated environment. It opens the door for all sorts of people to come through that would never go to a church or a counselor for those things. This is the lifeblood of the association, and this is what will make the difference in people's lives. One sign it's working, where there used to be just 10 chaplains in American Wise, now there are 65 with more coming, and the Wise are widespread. Folks here hope that someday you'll be able to go into any Y, anywhere, not just have a great time, get fit, learn great life skills, but actually meet the author of life himself. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from Orlando, Florida. Those are your top stories. Terry has more of the 700 Club after this. What's the secret to living a long life? Is it diet? Is it exercise? Genetics, maybe? Well, those could all play their part. But John Jessup introduces us to one man who has a simple philosophy when it comes to aging. And at age 101, he speaks from a wealth of experience. In the sunny city of St. Petersburg, Willie Rogers is a bit of a local celebrity. I've known Mr. Rogers for years. When I was a kid growing up, he walked a lot. He always walked. He holds a key to the city. His birthday parties draw crowds, including politicians. We are deeply honored. And his portrait prominently hangs in the local history museum. Yet he describes himself as no one's special, a lesson in character development he and his siblings learned early on. My granddaddy, on my daddy's side, he always told me and Roy uh, that ain't nobody better than you and you ain't no better than nobody else. Truth is, few have lived a life as remarkable or as long as Mr. Rogers. Last month, family and friends threw him a surprise party to celebrate his 101st birthday. I didn't have the least idea. I was thought I was going to Burberry to see my sister. Longevity runs in the family. His youngest and only surviving sibling, Gertrude, is 92. Who is that good-looking man? Age doesn't slow down this super senior. He lives on his own. I would put. My spirit, Keeps his mind sharp with daily Bible readings. 
and still gets around pretty well. Just about every week, Mr. Rogers walks a block and a half from his apartment to attend Sunday worship services here at the historic Bethel AME Church. Now, Mr. Rogers has been a resident of St. Petersburg for more than 70 years, and the majority of that time he's been a member of this church. One of my great uh, mentors uh, who's gone on to be with the Lord, she said, oh, that church, that church, Mr. Rogers goes to that church. He's witnessed a lot of change in his time, born during the First World War, six years before women could vote, and when America's population was a third of what it is today. He's also helped to bring change by serving his country during World War II as part of the famous segregated military unit, the Tuskegee Airmen. First, I was in the Army for about four months. But he was soon transferred to the Air Force and deployed to fight. I never was a pilot. I had other assignments. On a mission in Italy, he was cornered by enemy fire and shot in the stomach by German soldiers. I said, we're going to get killed anyway. I said, we guess what? I ain't going to die no coward. I said, I'm coming out of here. And survived. Although I was in the hospital at the 63rd General Hospital in London, England for about three months. Only recently did his family learn his unknown story. Hearing this stuff for the first time, you know, um, in the beginning it was like, what, daddy, really? You know, because he never said a word. Through research, they confirmed his status as a documented original Tuskegee Airman, defined as a man or a woman, military or civilian, black or white, who served at Tuskegee Army Airfield or in any of the programs stemming from the Tuskegee experience. The Tuskegee Airmen helped win a war and you help change our nation for the better. In recent years, their heroics, sacrifices, and role in integrating the military ahead of the civil rights movement have been recognized with a congressional gold medal and in film. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this glorious day. We ask that you send your angels down to surround us as we fly through the sky. I look at it as all those that have gone on before him who didn't have the opportunity to receive the recognition, he's standing in the gap. So what does Mr. Rogers think of the attention? I appreciate it, but I be trying to talk to my Heavenly Father and try to live a Christian life. At 101, he's still teaching life lessons. So generous. Um, that's the lesson that I have from him, how generous he is. He has taught me uh, in my short time as his pastor uh, a greater sense of reverence for people. His love for people and the Lord is um, a great motivator for our young people. And despite a 90-year age gap, his great-grandchildren say he's pretty cool. Granddad. I go granddaddy. I think he's a very fun man. I am very proud of my grandfather for what he's done for the United States of America and the Army. So what's the secret to longevity? He says it's loving God and living by the golden rule. Still going strong, he's now looking forward to 102. We just want to see how many more he can make because there's no symbols, no signs of slowing down. He, you know, he's just marching forward and we just have to try to follow to keep up. While Willie Rogers may not be a household name or mentioned in the history books, one thing's for sure. I'm just trying to live for my heavenly father. His legacy of service, humility, and faith is undeniable. John Jessup, CBN News, St. Petersburg, Florida. Well, congratulations, Mr. Willie Rogers. That is a recognition well-deserved, and you're still teaching us today. I just want to take a minute to give a shout-out to my mother-in-law, who lives outside of Chicago, who turns 100 in June and Skypes with my husband every Wednesday on her new computer. <laughs> Well, up next, we pull back the curtain on the sex trade flourishing right here in America. The girls, they were first sold into the trade at age 11 or 12 or 13. The message that they're sending is, I know you came here to work in a restaurant, but you're going to be working in the sex trade. Meet the amazing woman who's giving these enslaved girls hope for their freedom and their future.
Well, the story you're about to see may shock you. It may seem unbelievable that girls as young as 11 are being ensnared in the sex trade right here in the United States. But this travesty is all too real. The girls, they were first sold into the trade at age 11 or 12 or 13. She would work in there 13, 14, 15 hours a day, day after day after day. And this is the part I will never forget. She said, I didn't know anyone knew what was happening to me. This is one of several Korean brothels on this road. Women are usually sold for about 50 to $100 based on online reviews. Men actually will go online and rate their encounters with these women. This little girl was from Nebraska. Her friends set her up. This big trucker took her to Dallas, and then one of his partners brought her down to Houston and was trafficking her. She had a UTI so bad she could barely walk when we got her, and she was underage. The message that they're sending is, I know you came here to work in a restaurant, but you're gonna be working in the sex trade. No one wakes up one day and says, oh, I just wanna go take my clothes off, gyrate and be groped, or be violated, or in some cases abused physically. Spend the weekend with your dad's friend or go across the street to this man and he's gonna give you money for our light bill. I've encountered that. Two of the three survivors on our staff were sold by their parents. That is supposed Kat to French heads up a team of passionate young people who are trying to bring justice for trafficked and prostituted women through prayer. That you would break their bonds into you, God, that you would break every chain, Lord. Awareness. So there's a lot of trafficking. There's lots of online ads for prostitution and purchasing of sex in this area. And intervention. I got a call at 4 o'clock the next morning saying, my pimp is asleep, can you come and get me? She had earned $30,000 for her trafficker that summer in Houston, and she got $71 when he bought her a new pair of shoes. Then we got her a bus ticket back to her family in Ohio. Elijah Rising is putting its stamp on the fight to end the sex trade in Houston and having great success. More than 7,000 people have taken the ministry's eye-opening van tours. You can see all this stuff looks like it's totally closed down. But you turn the corner and this parking lot would be completely full, um, you know, weekend nights, sometimes even evening nights. This club had 17 little uh, partitioned rooms upstairs, and we know of minors being trafficked in this location. These experiences have prompted private citizens to create an uproar that has led to the closing of several brothels. People also volunteer with the intervention team, making calls, visiting brothels, offering a way out. One of their most effective tools, a lipstick with the hotline number hidden in the barcode. The older female got up to go to the bathroom. The outreach worker swooped in and said, do you need help? And uh, the young girl pulled out this tube of lipstick and she said, I need someone to call this phone number for me right now. Um, and it was our rescue number. With all their success, Elijah Rising now faces a bigger problem. How to help those who are ready to break free. We give out those numbers and it's hard because the only place right now we have for them to put them is so temporary. It's only a couple of days and then we gotta find them something else. And it's not even configured for a girl out of the life. It's for domestic abuse victims. And you know, they get lonely, they get bored and stir crazy really quick. So what do they do? They call somebody, takes them right back where they were. My long-term vision is to innovate because we need it. After all, recidivism rate is 75%. We need something new on the horizon. So why not here? Why not us? Why not us? Why not now? With that purpose in mind, Orphan's Promise is coming alongside Kat and her team in a new venture, 
an 85-acre farm outside Houston. Already, they're working hard to renovate existing buildings, preparing a place for girls, women, and their children to come for healing and restoration. Girls who think nobody could possibly love them after what they've done. Girls who are estranged from their families. Girls who are scared and could easily run back to the sex trade because it's all they know. When they come here, they'll have a community because believe me, she didn't get into the trade alone. She got into the trade with a constellation of bad people around her. And so when she comes here, she's gonna have a community. Some of the innovative care will include equine therapy, trauma-based counseling, small business enterprise, self-sustainability projects, and basic life skills. And so that's a big thing is it's you're worth it to learn these skills so that you can really dream for your future, that it really absolutely is still possible no matter what you've been through. It just doesn't matter. It doesn't trump the call of God on their life. All right, slide it in towards me. The restoration process at the farm is daunting at times. So it's encouraging to see the community and local churches supporting the effort. A nearby nursery will donate a prayer garden. A men's group financed basic supplies to get temporary running water. The gifts of trucks, horses, domestic supplies, and most Saturdays, a crew of volunteers. Today, we're actually um, planting a garden. My husband is hanging some barn doors. It's amazing to go to the streets to see who you're impacting, and then on this side of it to see that when, not if, but when the Lord brings them out of that, that there is a place like this. So it's, uh, it's very humbling. The evils in the human trafficking industry are unspeakable, and the enemy seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. But we are united with Elijah Rising and steadfast in our commitment to bring healing, justice, and deliverance to victims of this terrible trade. And I say that that story was about what's going on in Houston, but Houston isn't the only city in the United States where the sex trade is flourishing. What I love about what Kat French and her team are doing is it's not just about awareness. We all know it's an issue. We all know it's a blight on our culture, on our society. They're actively doing something to make a difference on so many fronts. And by standing up and making their voices heard, they have enlisted churches, private individuals, politicians, uh, government agencies, everybody standing up and saying, this will not happen in our community without a very big fight. So they've gone before us with their passion and they've left us with a template. Orphan's Promise is so proud to be a part of what they're doing down there. And if you'd like to be a part of helping us with that project, all you need to do is log on to CBN.com or you can call our toll-free number 1-800-759-0700. Orphan's Promise is CBN's outreach to orphaned and vulnerable children and young people around the world. And these certainly are vulnerable young people. So be a part of making a difference. Don't just look and shake your head and say, that's really really too bad. Stand up and let's go together and let's really impact this terrible blight. We can make a difference. Well, coming up, a dad bears his soul about the most painful day in his life. When our daughter was just four months old, she was diagnosed with a rare brain disorder called mesencephaly. I remember my wife and I feeling so overwhelmed, pain, agony, defeat. See how this special child is now literally making her mark all over the world. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Investigators in Costa Rica are looking into the cause of a plane crash Sunday that killed 10 Americans. The charter aircraft crashed in the woods soon after takeoff at noon in the northwest part of the country. Two crew members were also killed. The pilot was described as very experienced. Five of the dead Americans are a family of five, a mother, father, and three sons from Scarsdale, New York. 
Investigators are looking into a shooting in suburban Denver that killed a sheriff's deputy and wounded four other deputies. Authorities say the officers were called to an apartment complex for verbal disturbance when they were ambushed and shot at. Matthew Ryle then fired more than 100 rounds before SWAT officers entered and killed Ryle in a shootout. Ryle had previously posted videos online railing against the local sheriff and police. Remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by visiting our website. It's CBNNews.com. Veach remembers April 10th of 2012 as if it were yesterday. He and his wife Julia refer to it as Diagnosis Day, the day when they were told that their four-month-old daughter Georgia would never develop past three months. She would never walk and she would never talk. I'll never forget when our daughter was just four months old. She was diagnosed with a rare brain disorder called lissencephaly. I remember my wife and I feeling so overwhelmed, pain, agony, defeat. I remember that's when we really felt a sense that we could put all of our confidence and all of our hope in Jesus. And when we put our hope in God, it's because the evidence found him to be truthful, trustworthy, and loyal no matter what we're going through. Hope is the architect, and faith is the builder. We posted this photo, this Instagram, of us with our G's, and it really just took off and became something that, you know, no one could have ever foreseen. We're people from strangers that we don't know, to celebrities, to, you know, family members are getting this tattoo, and it's all to say, we're believing for this girl to be healed, but we're also believing for ourselves. I think it speaks to the beauty of humanity. Please welcome to the 700 Club, the author of Unreasonable Hope, Chad Veach. Boy, Chad, what a book, what a story. I oh, mean, thank you. I want you, if you will, to take a moment to just walk us through Diagnosis Day as you do yeah. in the book and what that was like for you and Julia. Yeah, well, I think, you know, it's one thing to find out when uh, your wife's pregnant yes. and you could prepare yourself. But I think for us, the, the cliff was such a, a yeah. tall cliff to fall off of. It was such a high cliff because she was four months old. So you had all the excitement yeah. of new, you know, your first Instagram post with the right filter yeah. and, you know, the new outfits. And she was born right before Christmas. So the celebration. So yeah. we were really excited. You know, there was so well, much and joy. All the hope of what's to come. Yes, exactly. It's just part of being a new parent. So we, we kind of noticed something was, was up. Well, to be honest, grandma did, yeah. you know, it, it's your firstborn, you so nothing's it, wrong. You don't want to see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So mm -hmm. my mom was a little bit, you know, uh, cautious going, hey, you need to go check this out. So I thought something was wrong with her eyes. I thought maybe they'll correct, you know, put a, a patch over her eye, a, a little, surgery. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Never did we ever in a million years expect for them to say your daughter's brain did not form. Listen, Cephaly, this word, I had never heard of it. So it was a um, diagnosis wow. day is a, is a day I'll never forget. The, the anniversary just passed two days ago and um, it's been four years. And I will never forget the feeling of asking God, what am I gonna do as a, as a husband, as a father? How do we face this? So I think early on, right from the beginning, we had to make the decision. Yeah. We're gonna put our hope in God. Yeah. We're gonna take all of this pain and we're gonna praise God through it. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to find hope through it. I think hope is this, sometimes it could be elusive in a, in a way, and uh, it could be a second cousin to faith. Yes. I found hope to be this confident expectation, not that my daughter would be healed alone, mm -hmm. but I have hope in a better place, heaven. Yeah. I have hope in a person, his name is Jesus. Yeah. And that's how, why I think the Bible says hope can't disappoint us. You know, God uses everything, everything, things that just life throws at us, things mm. that the enemy puts in front of us. This has truly changed mm. how you see other people, how you feel their pain. Absolutely. Yeah, I didn't realize other people were in pain until I had pain. And then once we faced this, it, I, my eyes were open. I started to look around going, 
oh my gosh, people are suffering. Yeah. It, it, it changes. It's just different. It changes your, your sense of compassion, yeah. sympathy, empathy, your relatability. Mm -hmm. It just, it, it changes you on the inside. You know, I often say, I wouldn't trade this yeah. for anything. It's, it's yeah. made us better people. You know, we're, we talked about Diagnosis Day, and you know, you all hearing this story might say, okay, so their child was diagnosed with this condition. Yeah. But talk about Seizure Day, because that's what started to change your life. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's one thing to have this diagnosis, and you go home and you gotta face that, but yeah. some people have events, you know, a car accident, or yeah. you know, something happens. We had to continually face our storm. Yeah. And you know, the seizures started to come where some days 10, some days up to 50 seizures in one day. And mm. we started to realize life is not gonna be normal yeah. for us all the time. So we're gonna have to learn how to combat this and, and smile through it and help her. And so talk about how you did that. You and Julia are both Christians. You know, it's so easy to quote scriptures about yeah. faith and to say, I have hope for the, <laughs> but when you're in the yeah. trenches, yeah. I mean, that's another story. Yeah, well, I think the first thing we had to do is say, hey, the struggle is real. Yes. You know, I, I don't think God can work with the fake us. I think mm -hmm. he wants to work with the real us. Yeah. You know, David said. And he, he understands. Yeah, he does. Yes. You de God desires truth in our innermost parts. Yeah. So we had to be honest. This is frustrating. This hurts. This well, is not have, easy. You also had to work through how you as a couple were going to handle this. I love the story that you tell of early on where Julia couldn't sleep and woke you up and said, yeah. I need to know yeah. that if she dies in a seizure tonight, you're not gonna blame me. Yeah, absolutely. Because we have those feelings. Yeah, I think what I've learned through all this is that God is honest. He yes. loves our honesty. He embraces it. He has room for it. He's not mm -hmm. intimidated by it. And Julia and I have learned to be honest with each other, to be honest with God. And that brings a peace in itself. Yeah. Because I can just, I don't wanna just quote a bunch of scriptures and you know motivational quotes from social media. Mm -hmm. Gotta be honest with how I feel yeah. because then I can really resolve in my heart, even though I feel this way, I know truth and God is real. Yeah. He is here, and even he though I can't see it. This. He didn't because cause we this. All, that's the first thing that comes to mind is God, why would you do this? Yeah, yeah. You know, the, I don't think for a moment that God was in heaven with his arms full going, let's see how you can handle this mm, young preacher. Yes. Let's see how you and your family will you know, overcome this obstacle. I, I don't believe sickness is from God. Yeah. I think that you know, we live in a fallen planet, a Absolutely. fallen universe, these things happen. And that's why we wrote the book is because, you know, a, a sick daughter could happen, a divorce could happen. These these things happen. How are we going to overcome? Yeah. How are we going to get better? Mm -hmm. How are we going to allow God to take this pain and turn it around for purpose? One of the things that you discovered in all of this, too, was the amazing support of people you didn't <laughs> even know. I want you to talk about the, the G. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, the the. The cover is this G, this pink G. It was amazing. I was in New York preaching. My friend had this idea. He goes, I'm going to get a tattoo for your daughter. And I go, if you're getting the tattoo, I'm getting the tattoo. And, you know, we just posted this photo, hashtag GTAT, just me and my buddy. And we never in a million years anticipated what, yeah. what could happen from there. People just started getting this tattoo, just the snowball and effect. And saying, we're standing with you, and every time yes. we see the tattoo, we're gonna pray in yeah. conjunction with what you're praying. And you know what, I think it started there, that was the genesis of it, but then I, I'll, I'll find people on social media say, I lost my, my aunt to cancer, mm. and this is for my aunt, this G. Yeah. It's, it's a symbol, symbols carry so much weight. Symbol I think this, it's a symbol of hope, it's a mm -hmm. symbol of God's grace, His love. Yeah. And we just, it's amazing. I prayed that God would use Georgia when, when, when Julia was pregnant with her. And we're seeing God use our daughter, even in her sickness, yeah. around the world to bring hope. Which is just another wild affirmation of the fact that he has us carved. He's got his own <laughs> tattoo of us. I love the way you put that. Right. We are tattooed on the hand of God forever yeah. and ever. It, he knows us. What a truth that God yeah. engraved us in his hands, not, not on his shoulder blade, not on, you know, not on his arms or bicep. Mm -hmm. He put us in his hands yeah. to prove his love for us. Mm -hmm. he, 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 I don't think that, uh, you know, screams love more than anything else. You know, we just are skimming the tip of the iceberg. You can read all about Georgia, the impact she's making. Most of all, you will find unreasonable hope for your own life circumstances in this book. It's available wherever books are sold, and I just can't recommend it enough. Thank you so much. What a story.
You guys are special. Appreciate it. It's great. Thank you. Well, up next, a mother of four who was herself in crippling pain for two years. I started experiencing a shooting pain that went down my legs and up my spine when I walked. So with every step I took, it was really painful. See how that pain vanished in an instant. That story's coming up. To listen to our top songs of the week, go to CBN Radio at CBN.com. Carrie Carter loves to get outside and enjoys being active with her four children. But a year ago, this was impossible for her because with every step she took, Carrie was in tremendous pain. When Carrie Carter had her fourth child, she decided it was time to leave nursing and be a stay-at-home mom. I worked during the pregnancy with, with my fourth child, and after she was born, um, you know, I went home like normal. It was an, a, a normal delivery, nothing out of the ordinary as far as the delivery, no complications. But it wasn't long before her back started hurting. Right after the birth, the, the, it was just a dull ache, that, and I just associated that with childbirth and I thought that it would just clear up. Instead, it got worse. I started experiencing a shooting pain that went down my legs and up my spine when I walked. So with every step I took, it was like this kind of electrical sensation that went through my body that was really painful. She and her husband were now on one income. She didn't think she should pursue treatment. I knew that x-rays would be expensive and at the time because I was staying home taking care of the kids and you know one income family we couldn't afford the extra expense for that. For two years Carrie endured the pain. She tried over-the-counter pain relievers but nothing seemed to help. The pain changed my lifestyle because I quit doing the normal things that I enjoyed doing. I quit taking the kids out for a walk with the stroller. I didn't want to run around with the two-year-old. I had begun to really start seeking the Lord about healing in particular because in my heart I knew that it was God's will to heal. She also watched the 700 Club almost every day. On June 12th, 2015, Terry gave a word of knowledge. Someone else, you have um, like a spinal problem. I'm not sure what it is, if it's an alignment issue. Uh, tremendous pain every time you walk. God's healing that condition for you right now. I knew that what she had spoken was directly for me. And I could tell immediately, I stopped having the pain with walking. I've been pain free since. I've been able to walk and I could go back to my normal lifting things I couldn't um, do before. Most importantly, she can do the things she loves, especially taking care of her children. I like to go for walks, um, enjoy the outdoors, enjoy being with the kids. Motherhood is the best thing. It really is. It's a blessing. I'm very thankful. I'm very grateful. He knows what your need is and he's willing to meet it and he's willing to meet you right where you're at. You don't have to do anything special. You just have to believe. I love Carrie's story. When I hear all that she's gone through, I think of the scripture that says that Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly. Well, this is Jean who lives in Ephrata, Pennsylvania. She developed excruciating pain on the right side of her body. In addition to the pain, her right side was very tender to the touch and she suffered from nausea and vomiting. That pain continued for three days until she decided to call the 700 Club for prayer. You can do that, you know. After she hung up the phone, she noticed that all the pain had disappeared. Jean has been pain-free since. We want to stand with you today in your place of need right now in this moment. And, and let's pray. Let's, let's go to the Lord and say, you are the healer. You are the redeemer. You are, you are all powerful. You know you know me inside and out. You're in my tomorrow. And let's ask him to do something miraculous for you today. Jesus, we're just, you, you took our pain upon you. you with, by your stripes, we're healed. You did it all. 
And everyone who came to you, you healed. Everyone who came to you, you touched. And so today, God, we're coming to you in faith. And we're saying, will you touch us? Will you send forth that healing power that only you have? As we reach up to you, you've promised that you're reaching back down to us. And so today, God, speak into the very point of our need. Teach us and tell us more of who you are. Heal us, Savior, we pray. Heal us. There's someone, you have a chronic, um, like a muscle condition in your neck and your head. It's like everything's disconnected there, not physically, but you, it's, it's not, things aren't happening in your body the way they're supposed to on brain impulse. And so right now, God is just setting that all back in order. He's your creator. He understands how you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Just receive that from him right now. Someone else, you have, um, you have like a chronic sweating condition, but I mean, it's really chronic. Your hands, your feet, just everywhere. And it's so life interrupting for you. God's writing that in your body right now. Just receive it. Someone else, you've had an appendix attack, but it's already ruptured and you've, you're trying to recover. Your body's trying to get rid of all of those toxins. Right now, just receive healing from the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, God. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that you see us in our need and you so love us and want to meet every aspect of it. Use us. Teach us to walk with you daily. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, I want to say to you, our lines are always available to you. And just because something that you're dealing with in your life isn't said on this program or mentioned in prayer, God's power is... It's not what we say that initiates it. We're just sharing what God shares with us, but His power is available to you. And if you'd like to pray with someone specifically about your need, call our toll-free number, 1-800-759-0700. In April of 2004, a college student from Vancouver was kidnapped at gunpoint and forced into his own car. Over the next several days, he was beaten, threatened, and held for a large ransom. It took more than a week for the police to rescue him. But singer Bosco Poon knew where the victim was all along. He was in the basement of Bosco's own house. Bosco Poon grew up a shy, insecure immigrant from Hong Kong. He longed to fit in somewhere, and a Chinese gang drew him in. They introduced me to a world that was so foreign to me. Um, weed, uh, ecstasy. But Bosco had a dream, to become a musician. He left his friends and moved to another city to pursue a music career. I came out and, and become sober because I was so determined that I want to enter to the music industry. Two years later, his old friends called him with the offer to make some quick cash. Rent them a vacant house his parents owned, no questions asked. He did. He soon found out they had kidnapped a man and hidden him in the basement until the ransom was paid. They were very desperate. It almost feels like they were like a bunch of animals. I struggled in my head, like, should I just run down there and untie him and get him to the police station? Or should I just call 911? But also at the back of my mind, like all this fear was there. It's like constantly telling me, like, what if they find out that I, I let the guy go and, and then they turn their rages on me? It was then I realized, like, what have I done? Within a week, police had tracked down and arrested the kidnappers, including Bosco. I was put into the police car and then into the, the wagon, looking at my parents sobbing, looking at all the neighbors, like, poking their, their fingers at me. Bosco was convicted for his part in the kidnapping and sentenced to 12 years. He entered prison scared and alone. I was like, I don't know how can I survive in here? It was full of violence, drugs, depravity, broken hearts, pain, screaming, crying. So I did a lot of time to reflect on stuff, which I never did before. The reality of a situation hit him hard. I was sobbing, crying out to God. I was like, Lord, are you real? <laughs> well, if you are real, 
can you talk to me? Because I have nobody else. And then this scripture came to me. Jesus says, I'm always with you until the end of the age. I claimed that scripture. I was like, Lord, talk to me if you're real. Because I really need someone to talk to right now. My heart was fully ready to receive God and to have a real relationship with Him. Bosco surrendered his life to Jesus. A few weeks later, while in prayer, he had an incredible vision. I saw a cloud of great white light coming down from heaven. And then this light is just getting closer and closer till it, it reaches into my heart, lifted up my heart. I was like electrified. And then all that I could hear was a voice. Don't be afraid. I am your Lord and I will rescue you. Ever since that experience, I, I talked to him like I talk to you right now every day while I was in prison. And he just opened up my spiritual ears. He has experienced the power of God in his life. Something changed in him that caught him on fire. He was always talking to somebody about the Lord or coming into my office and saying, can we pray for so-and-so? The Lord challenged me one day to pray for my enemies. To be honest with you, I, I did not want to do that. I was like, no, Lord, this is too hard. But he was like, no, take my love and do it. My love is so much bigger than yours. Just, just, just focus your eyes on me and, and just try to do it. And, and when I did that, even though with tears streaming coming down from my eyes while I was praying for all my enemies, I found freedom. So God rescued me from that as well, rescued me from hatred. Bosco served four years behind bars. He is out of prison on parole. Today, he's surrounded with a new group of friends, including Canadian singer and songwriter Marika and Christian recording artist Brian Dirksen. He shares his testimony and music with others, hoping they will meet Jesus as he did. The same Jesus who revealed himself to me, the same Jesus that has rescued me, is the same Jesus that can come to any one of us out here. I only live for Jesus because He saved me, He gave me life. He showed me so many things. He's the source of my life, and He's my Lord and my Savior. I hope the message that you've gotten from our time together today is hope, hope. If you are in darkness, if you are alone, if you are in pain, if you've suffered great loss, if you have made terrible mistakes in your life, God's hand is always reaching down to you. His love always wanting to touch your life, to change you, to make things better because He is the giver of life. He's the one who created you with a plan and a purpose. Don't miss out on it. If you're struggling with things in your life, turn to Him. When the world walks away, He's still there. I will never leave you or forsake you is His promise. Invite him into your pain, into your hopelessness right now. He's real. He will speak to you just like he spoke to Bosco, just like he spoke to Carrie, just like he spoke to Chad and Julia Beach. You see, he's our father. He's our Abba Daddy, and he loves you very, very much. How does all of this happen in your life? It begins with you acknowledging that you're a sinner in need of a savior that God provided that in His Son, Jesus, that He wants to come right into the middle of your mess and bless you, touch you, change you, heal you. It's all yours for the asking. Ask Him right now. If you want someone to pray with you today specifically about what your need is, again, I encourage you to call our toll-free number. It's 1-800-759-0700. On the other end of that line is somebody who's already done what we're talking about. He'll make their day. So call now. We want to leave you with these encouraging words from Psalm 23, 4. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Check out the whole 23rd Psalm. It'll bless you. Thanks so much for being with us today. We always enjoy our time with you. We hope you'll join us again tomorrow for another program, The 700 Club. God bless you.